Kia ora koutou. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is one of the Winter Fireside Chat series that IT professionals are running, and we're really lucky today to have Jordan Carter join us to talk to us about all things internet governance. So kia ora, Jordan. Welcome. Kia ora, Vic. Um, thank you for the invitation, and nice to be here. It's going to be a fun next 45 minutes chatting with you. I'm looking forward to it. So as we were just in the preamble talking about last year, you moved to Melbourne for a new role. So tell me a bit about what you're doing now. Uh, so I'm, I've joined the Australian Domain Administration, AUDA, um, and it's got a, a role analogous to Internet NZ in New Zealand. It's the operator of the .au domain name space. Um, and my job is Internet Governance and Policy Director. Um, so I work with the CEO, Rosemary, other staff and the board, um, leading two strands of work. One is our Internet Governance work, quote unquote. So that's both domestically within Australia, working with the Internet community locally and uh, sort of leading artist participation in regional and global forums, processes and so on. Um, and it also involves... Uh, working on our sort of nascent public policy stance on technology and internet policy issues within Australia. So those are the two main pillars of what I do these days. So it's a bit different to what you were doing before, but similar at the same time. Some similar angles, um, but yeah, not a CEO role. So no, no boards to worry about, um, which is a nice <laughs> change after, after 10 years in the previous gig. Nice. Well, I thought the first thing I'd ask you was kind of getting right into it, how do we strike a balance between the freedom of speech and the need to prevent the spread of harmful or misleading information online? Because I think that's the crux of, of what we need to resolve at the moment. It is a tricky one. Um, and I'm, I'm expressing my personal views here. Um, just mm. to be clear, Ada doesn't have any stance on, on most of these issues. Um, and I think one way you can think about that balance is to um, distinguish between the freedom to express the view and the, the right to have that view promulgated or disseminated. Um, you know, to be a bit glib about it, you might have a right to say what you think, but you don't have a right to an audience. And so there's a, a little bit of work that I think that can be done around um, harmful or misleading information. It doesn't stop people saying anything per se, but does use um, some more intelligent techniques to slow down or uh, disencourage the distribution of it, right? Because the challenge we've got in the online environment is that people respond to emotional prompts. And it turns out that us being humans, we tend to get more riled up about negative um, things than mm. positive ones. And so uh, there's a, given the priority of some of the platforms on engagement at all costs, um, the, the system just automatically routes itself towards content that causes challenges or can cause challenges. So, so I think the balance around speech, the ability to pop up a website with your view or um, say what you like ranting on your Facebook page probably isn't the issue. It's all about how these systems amplify, how their algorithms select and curate content. Um, and in that, the big challenge is that they all have, well, the big ones, the ones with big reach, all got pretty reasonable terms and conditions. They're just pretty hopeless at enforcing them. So there's, right. there's something there about saying, okay, if, you, if you're standing up and saying you want to have a, a community um, standards approach um, and you want your, or your sort of system to be one where people can express themselves and, and find good content and build relationships and so on, that's fine, but please deliver on what you're promising um, and please deploy some of the large profits you make from these things into doing that work. Yeah, wow. And I love what you said about you don't have a right to an audience. I've never really thought about it that way. I think people get tangled on the idea of censorship, right, and of um, some, some faceless organization telling me what I can and cannot say. Um, and you know, maybe I'm lucky in that my views are pretty mainstream most of the time. So I don't, I don't feel like I'm going to run into that kind of approach. And I might feel differently if I was uh, kind of um, in a more radical stance on on things. I don't know because I'm not, so I can't really um, experience that mm -hmm. firsthand. But uh, I do think it's important that people, you know, you, like it's the old soapbox argument. You could get up at at Hyde Park, I guess, in London, or 
somewhere and stand and shout at the wind, or you might get accosted by some religious zealot when you walk down the footpath in Wellington. Um, but they can only shout so loudly. They, they can't stream to 50 million people or yeah. um, have their content amplified a billion times on Twitter. So I think that's, that's the difference. And, um, you know, just as in society, we have relatively careful regulation on all the other communications media that allow for that amplification. Uh, amplification. Um, it's probably um, not going to be forever that that doesn't apply to online spaces as well. Um, it doesn't make conceptual sense. I don't think for the online platforms to be um, a place where those kind of community standards don't apply. And by community, yeah. in this case, I mean those of the societies where they are. We would never say that anyone can broadcast anything they like on television. Um, you know, I don't see why we wouldn't be doing that. And that, of course, leads to a policy debate in New Zealand that I think is going a bit slower than I'd anticipated, which was the convergence of regulation um, between TV and media and online media and so on. I guess that strokes nicely into the next question I was going to ask you, and that was around internet governance-wise generally. How does Australia's approach differ from New Zealand's approach? And is the regulatory environment in Australia more advanced or more mature than our own? Are we pretty similar? what, What contrasts have you discovered since you've moved over there? I mean, it's such a broad field. I could talk about it for ages, but I'll try and <laughs> try and do a few little thought bubbles if you like. Yeah. Um, one of them might be the the different role of the domain name registries because Outer um, does its job under a terms of endorsement from the federal government here, um, so it does it at the pleasure of of the government. And in those terms of endorsement, um, outer participation in and resourcing of internet governance work explicitly is called out as a key function for the organization. Literally, it's put on the same level as operating the .au um, domain name system and keeping a, an open and transparent licensing and policy framework for the .au domain. Internet governance is the third of those pillars. So it's, it's a very highly prioritized within the strategy. It's resourced. Um, firmly within the organization, uh, the community looks to ADA to resource and support that. So we're doing things like um, we've, we've been accepted as the host for the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. Right. A mouthful that's even worse when you nice. call it APRIGF, which is its acronym. <laughs> um, we're doing that in Brisbane in August, and he was very, very welcome to come along and participate in that regional event. Um, we do a bit of convening at the local internet community through roundtables we have, um, uh, and we sort of attend uh, a, a fair range of regional and global fora as well. So um, that's a bigger slice of what Outer does and a bigger strategic um, focus than I think it is for internet and dead back in New Zealand. Um, and I think part of the logic of it here is that there's no other organization that would do it. Um, so if the domain registry doesn't finance and focus resources on that, it, uh, it's a gap in the national digital policy architecture, if you like. That's why it's a really important role for organizations like Outer to do. Um, if you take a different slice of the regulatory environment, um, I'll be a bit more circumspect here because I'm still pretty new to it. Mm-hmm. Um, the Australian government operates at a bit of a speed that the New Zealand government doesn't. So you'd, you know, Less so since the change of government last year, but still occasionally, you know, there was a discussion paper released on updating the country's cybersecurity strategy in March. Yeah. Um, uh, it might have been late February, but I think it was in March. And the strategy that's going to emerge from that is going to be released in July. And ministers are already putting uh, pretty yeah. clear signals out there about what the focus will be and what the goal of it is. And so uh, if I contrast that with... Um, a process that I sort of lost track of after I left New Zealand last year, the digital strategy for Aotearoa that that government was working on. Uh, That was a multiple time frame longer process. Um, Now that pace does mean that things can be done quickly when they need it. Uh, It gives a bit less space for reflection and consideration, shall we say. And so uh, you can get quicker moves here. They're not always the right moves. If you look at the Christchurch call example after the mass terrorist attacks in 2019, um, the Australian government very quickly moved to impose liability on um, 
companies that allowed material like that to stream. New Zealand took a very different approach of pulling together companies, countries, um, civil society through the Christchurch call process. Um, there isn't really any question that that slower, more gradual, more engaged process has achieved more than the Australian legislation did. But then, you know, as a contrast also, Australia's got, what, five times the population of New Zealand, um, a much bigger economy is seen as a bit more of an influential player on the world stage. So it's regulatory and legislative settings um, have more weight with some of these global platforms than New Zealand were. So, so oh. there's just a couple of thoughts there. There's some of that um, around scale and resourcing then. So in the cybersecurity space, because as you know, last year I spent the year as a minister, part of a ministerial advisory group for um, Andrew Little in the cybersecurity space. And we were looking at comparing and contrasting the New Zealand cybersecurity system with the Australian. And the, the, um, the budget allocated, the volume of staff applied, the level of focus, having a minister for cybersecurity, having brought all of their government functions together into one agency, which they did really quickly as well, just um, wasn't even proportionate to population difference. It was just that much more being expended by the Australian government on cybersecurity. Do you think it's, it, it is a scale issue that we suffer from here? I think it's a culture issue more primarily, but I'm still new here, so I don't want to mm. over overdo it. But um, people in this country seem to decide that they're going to do a thing and then do it. Um, and in, in the public sector, that will mean that there'll be quick changes in the way that ministerial structures are done or public service departments are put together. And, um, and then they get on with it. Um, and ministers aren't worried about being very clear with direction and so on. And so um, it just feels different. It feels more decisive, more assertive. And the people are like, oh, well, we might not agree with what you're doing, but at least you're getting on with it. Um, and so a sort of, uh, you know, it might mean that things are less thoroughly deliberated, but then if they're not and they go wrong, they'll, they'll change direction and sort out problems that emerge. So I think that might be part of it. Mm -hmm. There is a resource different. Like if I think about... Um, that some of the global forums that deal with internet questions, um, there's a much bigger than population or economy scale difference investment in public service resources to engage with it. Um, so, you know, there, there are teams working on international telco union and ICANN um, and internet governance topics in departments in Canberra that um, each of those teams has more than the entire New Zealand government official them. Um, and they're still seen as small, um, as, right. as underpowered for some of the work that needs to be done in some quarters. So, yeah, I feel like in some of these areas, it's just uh, the federal government in, in Canberra is just a bit more responsive to ministers and is a bit more, people are not afraid to put a bit of money and a bit of um, direction and then to sw switch it later. Um, yeah, you know, the idea people will release exposure drafts for a short period of legislation and then get on with it. So it's got a different sense about it, different sensibility. And while I'm off, I'm totally off topic now. I didn't prepare Jordan for any of these questions. Um, is, have you made any observations in your role and your capacity around the state versus federal government kind of model and? that having different impacts on the ability for things to move quickly or is the majority of the internet government space as a broad spectrum area all at federal government kind of level? Internet governance wise it's mostly federal um, and most of the regulators that play in this space are federal as well and um, so there's the safety commissioner's office and there's the you know, information privacy commission um, the ACCC, mm. the Competition and Consumer Commission, and so on. So that federal complexity hasn't played too much into what I've been dealing with so far, but um, it does, you know, cybersecurity is an example where there's a federal strategy. Most states have their own strategies where there are different reporting standards in different um, areas. Right. Um, and that, that complexity does slow things down for businesses that are operating across the country who face 
different or similar or slightly different obligations um, in different places. Um, and that's quite aside from the normal lack of harmonization that goes on in dealing with internet policy and government, which also applies here. It just applies more complicatedly because mm. of the federal state distinction. Um, the, the, quite a lot of resource goes into coordination and, and dialogue between the jurisdictions in a wide array of public areas. But I don't think um, internet policy doesn't have a high prominence here, just like it does in New Zealand. So um, it's not, I don't think it figures as largely in some of those discussions as more the sort of regular topics like health and education or security and, and law and order and so on. Well, thank you for indulging me. Sorry, I'll get back That's on right. to my, my list of questions I was mm. going to ask you. For anyone who's listening, though, if you have any questions that pop up, you can use the Q&A function and I'll ask those of Jordan. So the next area I wanted to go into was net neutrality. So maintaining a, new, a neutral internet while still allowing for innovation and growth is seeming to be increasingly challenging. And I just wonder what your thoughts are, are on the role of the internet giants, the Google, Facebooks, Apples um, of this world and the like, and what they play in this debate and net neutrality and what they should be contributing. Because um, I know that, that in some, some um, corners, people think that they should self-organise and in others, they think that legislation is the answer. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's an interesting lens to look at in terms of net neutrality on it, because that that term isn't one that I've heard used as much um, in recent years. But that, that's the concept that whether at the technical layer or the policy layer, different jurisdictions are pulling in different directions, um, and it might put at risk having a, a single namespace and reliable communications between countries and jurisdictions. Um, net neutrality still does come up a bit and it's coming up a, particularly in Europe at the moment but it isn't because of the big um, these big companies it's because of the telcos are trying to uh, get the Europeans to regulate to demand money from um, the um, from the big companies to pay for broadband infrastructure investment um, pay to play type things which is a direct breach of network neutrality um, wow. Because, of course, we as internet um, users pay the costs of the infrastructure through our ISP subscriber fee. Um, the ISPs are, in my view, trying to double dip when they also ask the people whose content we're choosing to consume to pay them as well. They're trying to exercise leverage from their um, termination monopoly of controlling that last mile of connectivity. So the, the big guys, they're generally on the user's side on that, um, which, of course, also serves their bottom line. And they've maintained, I think, a generally um, a generally supportive um, stance towards um, the global internet uh, and trying to keep it from fragmenting, while at the same time being responsive to the diverse legislative and regulatory obligations that countries are slowly building up. Um, so how do we manage that? How do we manage people's countries' rights to have their own sort of legal frameworks, understanding the things like what is criminal content, what is... Um, uh, def defamation, um, you know, the German stance on um, uh, Second World War and Nazi um, ideas and expression versus the stance in other countries that place priority on free expression, all that stuff can mm. kind of collide. Um, uh, but the, in, in terms of the um, innovation and growth, the risk, there is a separate risk as well, which is that there's always the temptation by these big companies that have succeeded to uh, accede to layers of regulatory impasse or compliance or reporting and stuff that has the effect um, intentionally or otherwise of drawing up the drawbridge behind them and mm -hmm. making future innovation and breakthroughs more difficult. Um, and that's, that's, it's a bit of a theory. Um, I haven't got any hard evidence to, to back it up, but people do mention that as a concern. Mm. Nice. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, new topic. You were very involved with the Christchurch call when you were the CEO of Internet New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Have you continued to be involved? And whether you are or not, where do you see this initiative going um, in the future? Um, I was involved in that. Um, and the interest there was um, our fear that the New Zealand response would be a lurch to a regulatory solution that wouldn't work. 
would be an example of sort of feel good politics rather than practical internet policy. Um, and back in 2019, at the first summit, I was asked by um, Jacinda Ardern and the New Zealand team to chair the summit of the civil society organization. Mm. I, um, I didn't expect to be having any ongoing role in it since I left the role, but the New Zealand did ask me to come back and be one of the MCs at the 2022 Christchurch Call Leaders Summit in New York, which was held last September. Um, I had the <laughs> dubious joy of um, having to be the MC for a session on algorithmic transparency, where the nice. countries and civil society were putting pressure on the big companies to um, be a bit more free with the knowledge and information that they're prepared to release so that scrutiny and understanding of algorithms could come on. Um, so that was a, a, a nice um, opportunity of recognition to be able to, to help with that. Um, I still think that the conversations that were had around the call made a significant difference in terms of the responsiveness of platforms to events like Christchurch, where things like that happen now. There are much better coordinated um, mm -hmm. responses that mean that content is blocked and taken down much more quickly and more effectively than it would have been. Um, I think the challenge for the call now is to um, make some progress on algorithms and a topic that's sort of not the same, but it's kind of coming up alongside it, which is these um, large language AI models that we're all talking yeah. about, chat, GPT, and so on, which will have um, you know, ongoing impacts on user experiences of, of technology as we move on through time. Um, and I think that maintaining the commitments to it from the companies and the countries that have signed up to it so far will come from continuing to deliver um, outcomes and that in turn relies on the, the countries and the people leading the call putting pressure you know being able to impose pressure to to make progress and so that was why i thought it was quite um any for the government to appoint um the former pm as the um envoy yeah. on this for the rest of this year at least um because she has that through globally to be able to apply some of that pressure and to work with heads of government and so on. So I'm not expecting any more personal involvement. Um, Internet and Dad was interested a bit in content harms in a way that out over here is not. So it's not so part of my day job. Um, we're more as an organization, but more focused on just the, the nuts and bolts of the DNS and then the global governance landscape and getting so much into the, the content area. So you opened the door and talking about the large language processing models and chat GPT, BARD and Bing search and, and, and all of the fabulous things that are emerging. Um, do you think there's enough discourse to be at the, happening at the moment to be really debating and moving the conversation forward on um, controls or transparency or any of the other kind of aspects that need to be tackled with those because they are going to be ubiquitous before we know it and built into everything we do in the internet and there's this high level of trust in these models. So do you think, do you think we're talking about it enough? Um. I don't, the short answer is I don't know in the New Zealand context because I'm not, yeah. I'm not seeing the, the debate um, so much from, from over here. Um, but it, it, I think we need to make sure to take the debate at a sort of a slightly measured pace, not with saying the pace of development of these models. Um, I say that though without being any kind of an expert on mm -hmm. the subject mm -hmm. fix, so I'm not. I, I'm a bit tentative about it. The, some some views I'm saying are sort of talking about a stampede to regulate that's unhelpful, um, mm -hmm. caused by sort of a lack of knowledge and a, a concern about possible future. You know, the, of the doomsday scenario of an AI model deciding that the future of the world is to maximize the number of paper clips, right? And we all get end up dying because we're buried in mountains of paper clips all around the world. I, I would prefer that to not happen. Um, I don't know if leaping into regulatory solutions is the way to do that. But it's got profile. I mean, you know, the, the chat GPT guy was the OpenAI Foundation was in front of Congress in the US this week. There are some interesting observatories that some of the universities in the US are running. Um, it's definitely one of the 
the future technologies, even though it seems less future these days than, than yeah. it did. So, so I think having the discussion about it is important, um, both in terms of what the tool does and because it's such a fast moving vector for some other important debates, you know, those sort of um, data sovereignty and localization discussions in Aotearoa, the sort of Māori Tanga implications of indigenous data and voice and language and culture and so on is another layer that, that, that feeds into the discussion. So if the discussion isn't going on in New Zealand, it really should be, but I, I don't think it needs to launch to an answer. And ironically enough, it's kind of a case study where internet governance approaches of getting all the key stakeholders together and arguing things through does really lend itself quite well. Um, so I'd encourage you and, and Internet NZ and other people in the tech sector, if the conversation isn't happening, to reaching out to some of the key government organizations and academics and make it happen. Because, you know, the worst thing would be to say, oh, well, that's not something we need to worry about. And the world's all progressing on and New Zealand's mm. falling behind. None of us want to see that. And I'm curious about that approach. Is, is consensus the goal of that approach? To, to have all of the parties come together and debate it out and then reach consensus? Or is the, is the goal to elicit the different views so that ex more exploratory work can be done on different perspectives? I think you can set it up either way. Um, right. and it, you just have to decide what you're trying to do. Uh, I don't even know enough about the policy area to know if you could come to a consensus on some key things. Um, you know, in some of the internet governance environments where that kind of consensus model is used, um, you get all this the feedback and points of view in the room, but you are there are ways to make decisions even if not everyone is agree. Um, so you could have that kind of broad-based dialogue that feeds into, I don't know, a regulatory or legislative process that the government is running and ultimately they're the decision maker. Or you could try and argue through to some approaches that are going to apply broadly in New Zealand that industry signs up to. I don't, I don't, the model is mm. kind of up to what outcome you're trying to achieve. Um, and it's up to the actors involved to sort of decide. And it feels like the space isn't mature enough to be heading towards standards or, you know, expanding the ISO standards for, for these pieces because it's all such new and emerging technologies. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering how we can progress things in the timely manner that we really need. I think getting a bit of grunt into scanning um, what's happening in the environment is part of it. Um, so, you know, following up the sort of, I think there's some principles led initiatives that are happening in the US and Europe. And I think um, in the, the, discussions in the EU around new legislation that's going to be tackling this. There's been some recent developments as well. So um, it's probably something I should pay more attention to. And I've got colleagues that, that are a bit following a bit more closely than I am. But mm. I don't think it's going to be a flash in a pan that then goes away again. Put it that way. I think it is going to be a growing thing and a tool that if, you know, like all the other tools that have come out of the internet, if we deal with it right and, and, put the right guardrails and principles around it could be enormously powerful uh, in a good way. Yeah? The internet can be a force for good um, or it cannot. And that's how it depends on how it gets shaped. And it does feel in recent years that we've lost sight of that force for good to some extent, doesn't it? That the internet, we, we've become so, or maybe it's just those of us who work in this space we become so consumed by the bad actors, by the cybersecurity activities, by the um, by by the people who are putting up mal and mis and disinformation that we've forgotten or lost sight. I, that's just my view. What do you think? That's a great observation. I mean, I th I think a lot of things about it. I think that the community or some some systems haven't been good at dealing with clear and present dangers that have been thrown up already by the technology. So if I think about some of the the um, violence online against Māori women um, that, that I was sort of hearing um, a lot about in 21 and 22, you know, the, the law enforcement side of things ought to have been reshaped to be able to deal effectively with that. Mm -hmm. And it did not seem like it had. I hope that there's been progress made since. Um, you know, the, the, 
at a sort of broader sort of narrative or feelings level, I guess, you know, quite a lot of us came into the 20 years ago being really positive. And there were lots of positive things happening and not very many negative ones. And now it feels to me like the situation is more balanced. There's still a phenomenal amount of good stuff happening mm. as a result of these technologies. Um, but there are bad things happening as well. And so if you ask the public, they all strongly express the views, like surveys and they've done, Ada has done in our part of the world. People strongly value and back the internet for its positives but they're much more cognizant of its negatives and want to see things done about them. And that's part of mm. the, the sophistication that policy and, and communities need to come to grips with, right? It isn't good enough to just say, oh, well, you know, that's not our problem. Um, we all need to be involved in tackling the harms that get caused and not pretending that they are someone else's problem. And this is a core challenge, right? Back to your question about internet governance, right? Because there are some institutions that are designed to deal with the domain name space or um, IP address allocation, or parameters and protocols that underlie how the internet works. None of those were given a mandate to decide what content should or shouldn't be online. Um, none of them were given a mandate to work out um, where the limits of free expression are. Um, but because there aren't any institutions that were given those jobs, um, they often get pushed our way, or we get blamed yeah. for not sorting them out. And so I think that that's the sort of next step for even if it's not internet governance, it's technology governance or, or whatever you want to call it, is to be much more upfront about tackling challenges and dealing with them in ways that don't break the good things, um, but that actually mean that this digital environment is good for people. Um, and that's, that's a debate that really is one that we're trying to foster here in Australia um, and that I hope that you and others in, in New Zealand want to as well. And it can be a bit innovating when you just get confronted with the negatives, right? Yeah. And so I think it is, it is. And sometimes when people are raising those negatives with you, the last thing they want to hear about is any good side of it. They're, they're hurt, they've been um, attacked, yeah. damaged, injured, and um, they don't want to hear the good side. They want to sort out the bad side yesterday. Uh, and I think that's you, when, they, when they say you, I don't mean you. I don't mean me, but the, the society as a whole you can't just say, oh, well, internet policy doesn't really matter. It's just about people putting gifts on the internet. Let's just like put that and relegate it right down the cabinet list. Let's take three years to a digital strategy. You know, it's just, it isn't good enough. <laughs> and it has real world impact that people shouldn't put up with. I do feel for politicians because digital technology concepts are really hard to understand if you're not in this space if this isn't your everyday life and and really hard to grasp some of these concepts and I can imagine you know I I remember having discussions with MPs a couple of years ago about trying to explain what digital twins were I imagine people having discussions with them now trying to explain what chat GPT is and what it's capable of doing and so you, you know it's really easy for us to to be frustrated and critical, but I can also imagine how difficult it is to prioritize this stuff. It is, but you start to unlock the resources to understand and make sense of it um, as a politician by deciding it's a priority. You know, the, the civil service and its analytic and policy capability goes where ministerial interest is. Mm. And governments have, have um, all the responsibility in the world for what they choose to make priority and what they choose to put resources into. Um, you know, these are some of the concepts in the internet and technology space are complicated, um, but some of them aren't. And, you know, someone like you is a wonderful translator. Um, and that's that's something I often thought about in my old job at Internet and Z. That a key thing there is to translate mm. between the the gobbledygook of the tech sector and yeah. what matters to, to people. And so, you know, the broader base those efforts are to engage MPs, engage ministers, um, have the media coverage of these things, putting up the challenge gently and respectfully, hopefully, to to people that this is important stuff that can't be left alone. Mm. Um, uh, the better. It needs to be done. It doesn't seem to be <laughs> happening all, that's all on its own, right? Well, I guess that leads into the last topic I want to talk to you about, which is something that, um, as you know, I spend a lot of my time in this uh, in the digital equity space, and you and I have had long conversations about 
approaches in the digital equity space and and how f- frustrating it has been here in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand at government not prioritising closing the digital divide in the way that many of us can see the benefits of um, such efforts. Have you had any opportunity to kind of look at the digital equity space in Australia at all in contrast or is that just a little bit far outside of the remit of what you're working on these days? It's a little bit outside. I mean, part Mm of um, Ado is pretty good at having a clear strategy and sticking to it. Uh, And the the public policy priorities that we've got don't include digital equity because it is a crowded playing field. Um, And so there is a there is a a a national coalition working on um, understanding, Mm -hmm. analyzing, advocating on digital equity issues. Um, But I'm I haven't connected with that that uh, myself. I mean the one of the key focuses here on that front has been connectivity, simply because the land mass is so much bigger. Um, but the NBN, the National Broadband Network, has has got a multi-technology mix, in, at least in part, to help tackle that problem. You know, they're launching satellites for um, non non cable related broadband access, um, continuing to slowly transition towards a more fiber based network in the cities. So, so I know there's that side of it, um, but in terms of the affordability, mm. skills, all the other things that can bring about a state of digital equity, it is just isn't something that's in my focus, I'm afraid. That's okay. I just thought I'd open the door on that topic. Um, I really, really appreciate you giving me your time this afternoon, and I know it's in the middle of your busy day, and you've just been travelling, and so I'm sure you're madly catching up from all of those activities. Um, but I really appreciate it. Was there anything I didn't ask you that you think we should have covered? Oh, that uh, <laughs> I, I haven't really thought about that properly. That's um, okay. I, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's, I sort of look, look back at Aotearoa and just I'd hope that, that these debates are continuing there and that the determination to do something about them is as strong as ever. Um, you know, the, the stuff that we're focused on here is, is related and it's always nice to sort of catch up with what's going on, going on at home. Um, I don't have any other sort of <laughs> burning uh, issues to, to put in front of the audience or the, to awesome. pick your brain about back, but um, really appreciate you having me back. Yeah. And thank you for your, time and I'll look forward to doing this again probably in a year's time and we can look back and contrast on how things have changed and what the next chat chat GPT is. (laughs) Yeah, well there will be one, I'm pretty sure of it. Yeah, I'll let you go then. Thanks Jordan and thanks everyone for listening. Ka kite. Thanks Vic, bye bye.